Hello, everybody. It's houseplant time. Welcome to Plant Prescription, the official houseplant podcast from Costa Farms. Uh, you are here with Michelle, IPM manager for Costa Farms, and Justin, a horticulturist here. Uh, we love talking houseplants, and we hope that you enjoy listening to us. How you doing, Michelle? I am doing well. I am ready for spring and summer to really hit. It feels like the weather has just not let go lately. And I've got my tomatoes. I've got my peppers. I'm all mentally ready for it. I'm just waiting for the moment when it's that nice spring day. It's raining right now, which is why why I went on that <laughs> tangent. I'm doing well. The weather is not. How are you doing, Justin? I am fantastic. Thank you um enjoying a really lovely day here in the northwest um which my houseplants are appreciative of uh you know the cloudy days make them a little bit sad the sunny days make them a lot happier oh isn't that ironic it's sunny there today huh i know i know huh. Huh. <laughs> yesterday it where? rained all day long and we had super fierce winds oh yeah it's been real windy lately so it's all good. Well, good. All right, let's jump in, Michelle. Um, first question today comes from Kylie in Grand Island, Nebraska. I think my Manjula pothos reverted because I didn't give it enough light. Will putting it underneath a grow light make the variegation come back? Hmm. You know, I feel like that's a question a lot of homeowners and or houseplant owners have asked a lot over the past couple of years, especially as variegated plants have gained popularity because I have seen, unfortunately, many my share of variegated plants become um, monochrome, so to say. <laughs> I'm um, sorry to hear that. It's all right. You know, I've I've I really haven't learned much. I was going to say I've learned my lesson, but I haven't really learned much because I am hopeful Justin will have a better answer. I don't have a really optimistic answer for this one. Um, what I found is sometimes light can have an impact on the amount of variegation, but at the same time, I've noticed some plants, if I give them too much light, they also won't variegate. Um, what I've found from experience is that it tends, I think, to be more of a genetic issue on my end. I found that cutting back to the leaf, the one with the variegation, if you cut it all the way back to there, sometimes it'll encourage it to flush out the new growth is variegated. Um, sometimes. Um, that's all I've got though. Justin, have you experienced this? Yeah. So with pothos, I think it's kind of nuanced. Um, some of the varieties, uh, like especially I've seen with global green, um and golden and um yesenia the variegation on old leaves can fade if it's not in enough light um putting it in brighter light will not make the variegation of those old leaves come back uh, but it can encourage better variegation in the new leaves uh, but like michelle was talking about you also have the genetic issue where the plant has actually undergone a mutation and lost the variegation in that case, there's absolutely nothing you can do because it's just the genetics. You can chop it back. True. If it but... is genetics, you can try to chop it back and kind of restart it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I didn't think about what you said. You're right. A lot of the times the variegation will come out nice and white. And then as the leaf hardens off, it turns a darker green. So I, yep. Oh, and sometimes they'll pop out, some plants will pop out non variegated leaves. And then it'll jump right back into it. It's very weird. Uh, it's it's the bane of my existence for some plants. If somebody ever figures out exactly what it is, or if there's like ever a little ray gun that we can you know, like put on the plants and mutate them back, let me know. I'm in the market. I think, I think that's one of the fun things about um, a lot of irrigation is mm -hmm. that it's unstable. And so... Um, on the happy side, you get that novelty of every leaf is a little bit different and what's it yeah. going to do next. And then on the on the less happy side, you know, there's that chance that because it's not 100% stable, it won't come back. There's always a risk. I would say is a rule of thumb that most pothos are pretty stable for the most part. Um, from what I've seen, um, whereas other plants may not be as stable, it really comes down to the variety. 
and who you got it from and blah, 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 blah. But starting with light is a really good idea. And then if it just continues down that path, then you think it's, it's, um, mutated again, maybe chopping it back. I doubt that's it though. Most, most pothos that I've had experience with don't typically revert. It's a little rarer for them to do that. It depends on the variety. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of our pothos varieties actually came from mutations. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you you kind of said a, a magic word there um, that might be good to get into, too. Oh. Um, the, the R word. Revert? Yeah, um, I've seen a lot of people talk about reversion being a light issue. Mm. Uh, you know, but really reversion is genetic. Yes. You know, um, and, and if it's losing, if it's variegation is fading because of light, it's not really a reversion issue. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. So. And I don't know, maybe because I'm a science <laughs> nerd, you know. Oh, no, I just realized we're talking about genetics again. I promise my professor in college I would never talk about genetics. If he hears this, he's going to get back my my uh, credentials and he's going to be like, Ugh, fail on the course, because I promised him I would never talk about genetics. We need to change topics. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Number two, this is much more up your alley, I suspect, okay. Michelle. All right. Um, Madison in Camden, South Carolina says, mm -hmm. I think there are white flies on my new house plant. What do I do? White fly? Um, well, it, white fly are pretty, pretty easy um, because they fly and they're white. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really easy diagnosis for the most part with white flies. They're super tiny. Um, sometimes, you know, a little fun, fun fact, if we're checking for white fly in crops, um, when we're, you know, scouting crops, Sometimes all it takes is like kind of kicking a pot, like lightly kicking. We don't abuse our plants, but like lightly tapping the pot with your foot. And if you see anything white kind of fly out of it, lots are you need to take a closer look and maybe white fly on there. So it's kind of fun way, fun, easy way to scout for white fly is just kick a plant. Um, OK, so she thinks she has white fly. Um, I honestly and I, I would love to recommend biologicals for this. But biologicals for whitefly inside just doesn't, it's just not going to be the best use, I don't think. So for something like whitefly, the adults are going to be kind of hard to get because when you disturb that plant, they're going to fly away. Um, but the good news is the adults will eventually die. Um, the bad news is you're going to want to keep their offspring at bay. Um, if you can get an adult with spraying it, that's fantastic. There's a lot of, I would recommend spraying. Um, there's a lot of over the counter or, you know, sprays that you can find at your local store for white fly. Just make sure it's labeled for white fly. Um, they also have piercing sucking mouth parts and can produce honeydew. Uh, so it is kind of a more of a specific thing. It's not like, you know, caterpillars eating a leaf, um, so I would just try to find something for white fly. And again, with most pests, try to hit the undersides of those leaves if you can. And follow the label, be safe. Spraying inside most, like, you know, things like oil and oil. <laughs> I'm not going to commit to much more than that. I could get myself in trouble. <laughs> but things like oil, you know, they're generally pretty safe indoors. Um, but always, 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 always check the label to make sure it is safe to use in a closed space. Or take your plant outside if the weather allows it and and give it a treatment out there where you're in the open air and less likely to come in contact with fumes or overspray. Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend that. Um, keep in mind that anytime you disturb the plant or touch it when you're spraying, odds are those adults are going to just fly away out of there. Um, so another way to catch those adults when they fly away and dodge your spray is you could put up some yellow sticky cards, like the little yellow sticky traps. Again, don't let them hit the leaves. I've had many a tragic experience where the sticky card has touched the leaf and ripped the leaf clear off. Also, be careful of your hair. <laughs> had a lot of sticky cards in the hair. Um, which is not fun. You lose a lot of hair in the process. Um, but those are great for catching the adults and to kind of help um, 
help them from escaping your spray of wrath when you go to spray your plants. All right, so Michelle, yellow sticky cards inside. Do you consider them more of a control tool or more of a diagnostic tool? Ooh, I've never really thought about it like that. Indoors, they definitely have more potential for control, but I wouldn't say that the control is absolute. Does that make sense? A lot of them, yep. some of the pests are always going to escape, but in an enclosed small setting, odds are you're going to catch more because odds are you're going to have more per square foot. Got it. I would never use them as control. I would use them to help you control. Um, and then what are your feelings on houseplant systemic insecticides, the kind that are absorbed by the plant um, taken up and then make the plant poisonous to pests for white fly since the adults are are mobile and not easy for contact sprays. I love that idea. Um, that would work and it would also work for the pupa. Um, so when you're looking for white fly, the adults are fairly easy. They fly on their white. Uh, the pupa are a little harder to see. Those are on the undersides of the leaves and they look like little, depending on the species, depending on the age, tan to orange to clear scabs on the bottom of leaves. Um, and those are also feeding from your plants. It's actually pretty funny because they'll just kind of, there's a crawler stage when they first hatch out of the eggs and then they'll kind of just plop down and that's where they sit and eat until they mature into an adult. What a life. Am I right? You know, to just hatch or be born and then go waddle off to some some spot that you call your own and just sit there and just eat, <laughs> not move. But okay, so I digress. Yes, both the those the, you know the ones that are stuck on the other side of the leaves and the adults are both feeding from your leaves. And so a systemic would work really well. Also, um, I do get nervous recommending too many systemics um, because there are only so many out there. Um, and I am concerned that over time they're going to lose efficacy, but it is worth a shot to try it. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. We hope that helps you, uh, Madison. Moving yeah. on to the next question. Uh, this comes from Joy in Olympia, Washington. I think I might have accidentally overwatered my snake plant. What do I do? You know, I'm guilty of doing that. I this is this is the thing I do because I'm like, oh, snake plant doesn't need water, so I don't water it for, I don't even know an undetermined amount of time. I never know how long it is. I just forget, and then I water it, and I water a little bit too heavy, um, and then it sits in the water for too long and dies. Hindsight, 2020, um, had I <laughs> realized that I had overwatered it. I would, I would take kind of like, uh, I would, <laughs> well, I'm struggling because I, I just, I would try to save it in any way possible, even if it wasn't that plan. If it was, if I could make babies from that plan, I would try to save it in any way possible. Does that make sense? Do you see where I'm going with this? It Jessica? absolutely makes sense. Yep. Okay. So I have unfortunately been in that situation. It is difficult for Sansevieria's personal experience, it was difficult for me to save it. Um, I tried to dry it down. Um, and I tried on one of them, <laughs> I've killed a couple on one of them. I even tried to remove the plant and kind of clean off, um, the rotted tissue, um, and then let it sit outside overnight, let it sit on the countertop and callus over. Because if you clean all that stuff off, you're just creating open wounds and sticking it back in soil certainly is not going to help with those open wounds. Um, so I kind of cut it all off, let it dry overnight and stick it back in. But then essentially you're rerouting a plant, um, that's already stressed. So hindsight 2020, I wish I had taken bits and pieces of it and try to make babies with it. I'm really depressing news today. I'm always like, ah, it's doomed. Ah, you know, cut it. I'm just in a cut it mood. Justin, please tell me you have more optimistic advice. It's the rain. <laughs> I will try. Um, so, so Joy, it depends on, you know, it depends on how far along it is. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the long and the short of it. 
Um, mm -hmm. If if you think it may be overwatered, but it's not showing any any symptomology of that, um, you're probably in great shape. Um, you know, if the if the potting mix is is wetter than you think it should be, um, and doesn't seem to be drying out fast, one of the things I've done is taken the 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 root ball out of the pot, leave it sit on a towel on the counter, um, so that way it's exposed to more air and it dries out faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so that can be a great way if if there's no rot setting in. Um, like Michelle said, though, once rot sets in, it's it's kind of tough. Um, taking cuttings may be your your very best bet. Um, that's that's what that's the way I would go about it. Um, you know, dryland plants are really great in dry conditions. They're really not so great in in wet conditions, unfortunately. Um, no, no plant is perfect. Yeah, and it's it's those drier, dry drought tolerant plants where when they do get a root rot, it is really difficult to recover those because I've had root rot in other plants as well and they seem to be a little bit more hardy, hardy bleh, in their recovery um hindsight 2020 you know uh but I I think it's a good point that Justin brings up to make sure that your plant does actually have root rot not that you think you just overwatered because you actually like me actually remembered to water it for once <laughs> Yeah, well, it, yeah, well, you know, while, while root rot certainly happens, you know, it's not an overnight thing. And if your plant stays wetter than it should be for 24 hours, it's still recoverable. 48 hours, probably go, go beyond that. And that's, I, in, in, depending on conditions, of course. Um, I'm, I'm being guilty here of overgeneralizing, which I always try not to do, but I'm going to add one more thing to that. Um, as, as a trend, um, when you dry a plant out, like really dry it out to where the, the soil is stiff and it's like light and light in color and light in weight, that can damage the roots. Um, so when you dry a plant out like that, it can damage the roots. And then when you over, when you water it and saturate it, those damaged roots with little lesions on them could be ultra susceptible to root rot. And so it's good to cycle as a rule of thumb, not all plants, I would say majority of plants with some exceptions, it's good to cycle them between being dry-ish and I would never say wet, but definitely moist. All the people who out there who love that word are just cringing right now. Um, Moist-ish um, because cycling them too hard, you could set yourself or your plant up for some root rot issues later down the line, which is so typical of Sansevieria. You know, we want to keep it dry. Um, and so I wonder sometimes if that's why it can get such really horrific root rot um, sometimes. Sansevieria is not the crop that I specialize in. So this is not you know, something that I'm an expert in, but it does kind of lead me to wonder. It makes a lot of sense, Michelle. Okay. And I want to ponder this more. Okay. Um, all right. Moving on to a misconception. Um, if you buy a Monstera or other climbing aeroid like that, um, you should prune off all of the aerial roots because they're not in soil, so they're not doing it any good anyway. Well, I mean, <laughs> you should come see my wall. They're doing a lot for that plant. They, it's not they're not they're not doing anything. Given the opportunity to latch onto a surface, they're definitely doing something. They're supporting that plant. Um, if it's grabbing onto something, if it's not, I don't know if it's really doing a whole lot. But I would, for personal again, personal experience, I would recommend if you're not trying to train your plant up a something surface i would chop them off just because personally i find them messy and also they always tend to find the wall that i just painted and they inevitably will rip the paint off the wall when you take those roots off because they are really good little suction cups they're like little octopus legs you know they just like stuck to the wall and then you rip your paint off and you're like ah so unless you're trying to train up something, and if you're trying to train up, up a wall, 
I would think twice about that unless it's a wall you don't really care about resurfacing and repainting. Um, I would cut them off just because they're annoying and they do find the wall and then they damage it. The downside of of cutting off aerial roots um, is that you are creating a bunch of open wounds on the plant, uh, making it more likely to get an infection or an infestation. Um, and if you're in a humid enough place, the roots can still be absorbing some of the humidity from the air and, and doing the plant some good. So I would, you know, unless it's really problematic, you know, if it's just a visual thing, you know, I would. What? I just pointed to myself because I was like, it oh. was extremely problematic <laughs> for me in my walls. <laughs> but yeah. And floors, watch your floors too, because it will, yeah. it tends to go into the baseboards of the floors if the roots get really long. It's, I'm thinking Monstera here. They're so typical for getting really long aerial roots. And they find a way into the cracks and crevices, be it the walls or what I found a lot is the baseboards, like the corner where the baseboard meets the floor. They like to wiggle themselves in there and they can get in there. It's, oh, yeah. If you're renting, I would be very careful about that. Your monstera are much, much more active than mine. Mine, mine sound very tame compared to yours. Yeah, mine are aggressive. Mine are little home destroyers. But I like including them. Love them. including Bertha, who I got from you. Oh yeah, with giant aerial roots. She was the one that originally made me really conscious of the floorboards because she wrecked my floorboards or my, yeah, my trim. Yes. In my apartment in, in Miami, she wrecked the trim. She got in there. Thank God. My landlord didn't hear about it. And he, he's listening now. He's like, Oh, I'm going to get her now. I knew something was <laughs> wrong, but no, totally got under it. Like got into the trim and like popped it a little bit. It was, I had to yank that out. It was not. Yeah. Watch out for her. Huh. So yeah, I am I'm not experiencing that at all with her. Um she's mm. she's living in my greenhouse. Um and thanks to the great mouse infestation um over the winter, um she has no aerial roots. <laughs> and <laughs> the mice eat the aerial roots? What? I don't think they ate them as much as they like chewed them off. Oh, that's so They strange. also chewed off all of her older leaves. What? You know yeah, what that means, yeah. Justin? You know, you know what that means? You know what you need? Nope. Don't even say it. A cat. <laughs> nope. A nope. Oh, just one. Just for the greenhouse. I mean, for the sake of Big Bertha. Yeah, not a cat fan here. Have bad allergies. But name off of the other animals that you are fans of, or you are a fan of, Justin. Uh, my dog. Mm -hmm. And what else do you have? Well, I mean, at the moment, I can say that's what I'm a fan of. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> in general, here on the farm, we also have <laughs> two cows, um, sheep. Oh, the sheep just had baby sheeps. Aww. Um, So now we have, at the moment, we have seven lambs running around. Oh. And they are so funny when they're born. Um, because their legs, like their 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 legs are out of proportion to their bodies. Oh yeah. Okay. Because they're they're so long. Yeah. And we are way outside of the range of the houseplant podcast now. Sorry, everybody, if so this sorry. makes the edit and you're still listening. <laughs> But everybody likes to hear about baby lambs, okay? But for for the audience who's stuck with us this long in the podcast, just know that the fact that Justin is against getting a cat is a little funny because he has so many other animals. And a cat is just one more to add to the list. You bear, you probably won't even see it because it's a cat. You know? Maybe. Okay. Okay, is that it for, we could talk about farm animals all day, but is that it for um, plant questions today? Did we do three? That, One, yep, two? yep, that's our three okay. and our misperception. Oh, cool, great. All right, everybody, we hope all is well in your houseplant world. And if it's not, by all means, shoot us a question. Um, you can visit our channel on YouTube. You can email us at questions at costafarms.com. 
Uh, you can message us on social media and we will do our best to help in a future episode. So happy gardening. Bye-bye.